Fraser Kane, welcome back to the program. Glad to be back. Fraser, it was a good year for space, 2023, and we got another good year coming with 2024. So what was your favorite development in space science for 2023? You're going to love this. It was cat videos from space. I take it for the pause. You have no idea what I'm talking about. So, um, so the NASA's Psyche mission is on its way to go to a metal asteroid, which is just the coolest thing ever. And that's going to keep us really entertained. But as part of the mission, they are testing out a tight beam laser communication system. And so when the spacecraft was tens of millions of kilometers away from Earth, they pointed back at our planet and they transmitted a cat video at hundreds of megabits per second, which is so much faster. When you think about the New Horizons mission, it was transmitting in just a couple of bits per second, and it took 18 months to transmit all of the data that was picked up from New Horizons when it passed by Pluto. You know, it's a couple of days of images. It took 18 months to get all that data back home. But Psyche is demonstrating that they have a new way to transmit data in space, which is via laser. And they picked up the transmission from Psyche with a telescope. And they were able to decode this, this high def, super high def video at incredible speed. And if this is, you know, with that demonstration, you're going to see some version of this technology be installed on almost every future mission from this point forward. And a lot of the missions that are just great ideas are held up because there's too much data that needs to be transferred home. And if this continues to be really successful, and we see more tests when it's out at Psyche, then we could see a complete new revolution in the way data is transmitted across the solar system to NASA and other space agencies. So it's a really game changing technology that is going to enable so much of the kinds of missions that I'm really excited about in the future. Yeah, it's a huge leap forward. And with Psyche in particular, that mission is going to something that we've sort of seen, but we've never really seen. And that is this intermix of metal and rock. Now we see this in meteorites yeah. with like palisites and yeah, mesociterites yeah. and all that. And actually I'm getting ready to buy one. There was a palisite found in Kenya that I'm interested in. But the thing is, is that those meteorites are weird. That olivine crystals and that just extreme differentiation between iron and stone. And we don't really know what sort of planetary body, you know, what are the conditions of that, that forming at the sort of boundary between the iron core of uh, an object and the silicate core. And you wonder, I mean, does Earth's mantle somehow resemble a palisite? <laughs> you know, so you you just don't know. Anything, right? Like, all we know is the density. We know the size and the mass of the asteroid. And, and that gives you the density. And the density is very rocky, bordering on metallic. And so it could be the exposed core of some planetesimal that went through some heavy bombardment. And it's just this chunk of metal in space. And yet... Because it was large enough, it probably had volcanoes, but the volcanoes would have been metal. And so there could be like metal volcanoes on the surface of Psyche. And so, and your imagination just runs wild with what could still be happening on this world. Or it could look very much just like a regular old asteroid. It's going to look dirty and, and like asphalt. And yet we know that it's got that density. And so when the spacecraft gets there, it can, it can orbit around it. It can start to make really detailed gravitational mapping of this, of this asteroid and tell us so much about it. But I, like you, I'm like rocky meteorites are fine, but they just feel like a rock. Metal meteorites are special. They feel like a piece of alien space metal, like absolutely that you're holding on to this thing that looks like an like an asteroid or like a you know a meteorite, but it is strangely heavy. And they are just wondrous. Like, I'm glad you're buying one. I've got a bunch of, of meteorites. And they're not that expensive, you know, for 10s of dollars, low hundreds of dollars for something a little more substantial, you can go out and buy a piece of space metal. And I guarantee it will give you superpowers. 
I do not have not superpowers caring. from my meteorite collection. Yeah, I mean, you you might. I mean, the superpowers are all really mundane. Like like one of my friends who I gave a meteorite to, he found that after he got it, he didn't have bad weather when he went when he went on motorcycle trips. Well, that's that's useful. Yeah, totally. So I think those are the kinds of low grade superpowers that you can expect when you own your own meteorite. So if you're in any way fascinated by this, get a meteorite. Yes, I, I may possibly have become better at boiling eggs as a result of a meteorite. That sounds really legit to me. Yes, yes, it's true. Now, interestingly, uh, when, when we talk about that, the idea that meteorites are weird, one of the weirdest aspects of iron meteorites is the Widmann-Staten pattern, where you can etch it with nitric acid and actually see the crystalline structure of this meteorite that probably was a result of it cooling and crystallizing out into different yeah. different sort of alloys of iron and nickel. And there's just nothing like that on Earth. Yeah, yeah. I, I was recently in Tucson, and they have a gem and mineral exhibit in in downtown Tucson, but it is really space based because, of course, they've got the Lunar Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona. I always get these. I have to be careful. Um, and it was it's amazing. I mean, they've got Osiris Rex exhibit and they've got a whole wall of just meteorites. They had the largest moon rock that I've ever seen. And and a lot of those like palisites, ones that are that are that are you know sliced down and then etched, and you see just this amazing crystalline pattern. Yeah, it's a man. It is a rabbit hole of a hobby to get into collecting meteorites. Like I just have the one big one, but I want more. There's a subset of that that I actually got involved with when I was a teenager. So there are, are two impact structures in my state, very ancient ones, and I would go down and collect shatter cones which are a geologic feature caused by a meteorite impact, you know, an asteroid impact. And I actually would go down there and hunt them. I still have some. I look at geologic, weird geologic features that are related to meteorites, in, in addition to actually metal detecting for them, which I never really found any. But I did find geologic shatter cones that are, are linked to uh, impacts. And I was always found that fascinating that, you know, a, an impact 15 million years ago is still evident. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, on Earth, and you can go out and try and find samples, even if the meteorite is gone. And another like version of this hobby that I think is really fascinating is looking for micrometeorites. And so you if you've got like a steel roof, and it's collecting debris, you can take that debris, and then you can put it in a bucket, separate it out, run a magnet through the debris, and you pull out all of these little spherules from your roof from your gutter. And then you can examine them under a microscope. And most of them are industrial pollutants. So they make these little, you know, coal ash, things like that, they make these little spheres, but some fraction of them one in 100, whatever, are clearly extra terrestrial. And you can tell that they are they are pieces of space metal that fell onto your roof. And you imagine how many of those are on your roof that are the rock kind that you just can't pick up with the magnet. So there's a, there's a great, I did an interview with somebody who does this. There's some books you can, you can look into. And so if you want to go meteor hunting, but you don't want to leave your house, uh, you can still do this. 